Hear the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory be to thee, O Lord. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God, for they had all heard and seen, as it had been told them. After eight days had passed, it was time to circumcise the child, and he was called Jesus, the name given to him by the angel, before he was conceived in the womb. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. So please be seated. <clears throat> Got a little visual aid today. You might recognise the words from the Old Testament reading as the blessing which I usually give at the end of a service, which I then kind of extemporise a little bit at the end. Recently, well, not that recently, but a while ago, those verses from Numbers were found in a tomb in Jerusalem. There was a, a tomb called, in a place called Ketef Hinnom, and in ancient times, the roof of the tomb had collapsed and buried the stuff that was in, in the kind of place. In those times, tombs, generally speaking, were kind of shared. A family would have a tomb, they would put a body in there, They'd wait for the body to decompose, they'd then wrap up the bones, put them in a jar or wrap them up in a box or something, put them to one side, and then when the next member of the family died, they'd be put in and the same thing happened. But sometimes there'd be something put in with the body. And so there'd be flasks of oil or wine occasionally, but sometimes it'll come with tokens. And in this place in Ketef Hinnom, the roof had collapsed and buried all the little odds and ends that had been placed with the bodies over the years. In it were two tiny scrolls. I think the reason I made them is partly because I found them hard to visualise. One of them was this size and shape. You can see that. It was originally made of silver, which is why I've made it out of tin foil. And if you come closer, you can see there's little bits of writing on it. I've actually written on it in something approximating what's called the Paleo-Hebrew script, which is the ancient Hebrew script used before the one which everyone now thinks of as the Hebrew script, which in fact is Aramaic. But this is the authentic ancient Hebrew script that was written in antiquity. And when I say that, I mean during the first temple period, which finished in 586 BC. So this scroll is earlier than 586 BC. There was two, the other one's slightly bigger. <laughs> But they've both got the same thing written on them, more or less, which is the blessing that we just read out. The blessing which is sometimes called the blessing of Aaron, or the ironic blessing, or the priestly blessing. You shall say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And those words of the blessing were inscribed on these little silver scrolls which were then rolled up and put into a little thing, maybe a little leather pouch hung around the neck or tied around the waist, maybe into a little bottle and secreted somewhere. The idea being it would act as a kind of amulet, a kind of talisman. But the, it was partly, I think, because of the idea of the name. If you remember that, what it says there, at the end of that, that passage in Numbers, it says, so they shall put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. The idea that the Lord would put his name on his people, and the idea of this name being placed there. When a, a, an ancient scroll, the, the, the Torah as it was called, was, was written, it would eventually wear out. It would become illegible or decomposed, it would just fall apart and become impractical to use. But when an ancient Torah scroll was, was worn out and no good for use, it wasn't simply binned. Because having had the name put on it, it was somehow more than simply a book or a scroll. It had become almost like a living thing. 
Because we, the Lord's people, who be made in his image, bear the divine name, we bear the divine image. Therefore, people need to be buried properly. You need to, if you like, acknowledge the divine image. And in the same way, the Israelites felt the need to acknowledge the name written on the scroll. And so they'd give it a funeral. So a worn out scroll of the Bible for the, for the Israelites would actually be buried in a grave with a funeral because it was almost considered like a living thing. You couldn't simply bin it because it had that name put on it, the divine name. And so by writing the name on these little scrolls, these little scrolls themselves became almost like a presence of the divine name. And because they were silver, they were kind of precious and long lasting. I'm that's pretty old, 800 BC or 600 BC or whenever it's written. And you can still read it, although not easily. I mean, it's pretty hard to read that, <laughs> like the original one. And so there's this desire for people to, if you like, touch the name, to somehow have it, to somehow have it close. And so that the blessing of that name would somehow be conferred or be maintained or be kind of transmitted through it. In a way, I'm not sure how efficacious that is. I'm not sure if it really works. You know, I'm, I'm not convinced that having written something on there that actually anything much really happens. But it, I think we can all relate to that desire. You know, people have these little tokens around their houses, don't they? You know, for good luck or for good karma or good chi or whatever else you're into. But that desire for somehow things to go well for things to be all right. Because there's lots of things in life that are outside our control. Lots of things which we cannot control. And if we kind of pretend we can control them, we're basically deluded. And sometimes if you have a run of good luck, you might say, if things go well for you for a while, you kind of think, that, oh, I'm really, no, I'm, I'm on top of this, you know, I can really do anything, I'm, I'm the man, I can, uh, I can control the world, the, the, the world's my oyster, I can, I'm in charge of my destiny. And then things go pear-shaped. And then you suddenly realise, you're not the master of the universe. You're not actually in control of anything. But so far you've just had a good run. And for some people, life is just this endless slog of things seemingly against them. And for some, it just seems so blessed. They just seem to cruise through life without any hindrance whatsoever. And most of us are somewhere in between. But here, I think there's these two vital things. The idea of the blessing and the idea of the name. <laughs> And how do we respond to that? How do we want, do we actually want the name? Do we actually want to be blessed? One of the themes recently, one of the Christmas readings, was that one about the, the sign and the child. And the Lord says to King Ahaz, you know, ask the Lord and he'll give you a sign, whatever you want, high as heaven, down to the depths of the earth, whatever. And Ahaz says, no, I don't want a sign. And that was basically him being awkward. Because if the Lord says, I'll give you a sign, the only polite thing is to say, well, okay, let's think of a sign. So by shrugging him off, he's saying, actually, I don't want anything to do with you, God. So at the heart of this question about the name and the blessing is, do we actually want anything to do with God? Because that's the kind of challenge presented to us. It's a kind of moral challenge, a spiritual challenge. How far do we want God to be involved in us? And yet, God is sovereign over everything. So surely if anyone can actually make any difference to how things go in life, he would be the one to ask, surely. I always think when you go to a shop, you don't want to speak to the minions, do you? You want to speak to the boss. <laughs> speak to the one in charge. So here we are with the boss. What do we want from the boss, from the one in charge? And I think one of the reasons that there's this desire that people have for these tokens around their houses and maybe on their person is because we do feel vulnerable. We feel frail at times. There are times when it feels more frail than others. But that general condition of frailty is what it means to be human. That's what we're like. And I think anyone honestly would admit we are frail. We are fragile. Things can go wrong for us very, very easily. And so <clears throat> coming to terms with that frailty, acknowledging that frailty, is one of the 
kind of tests of life, and it's something which we work on throughout our lives. And it's curious that some people who have terrible affliction, terrible suffering, are forced to deal with this. They're confronted with it hard. And sometimes they come through with it better than anyone else, because they're forced to deal with it. I'm remembering a man who um, broke his neck and <clears throat> was in a state so that he couldn't actually move any part of his body except his eyelids. And he's previously a very strong, vigorous man. I've got a feeling he's in the forces or something like that. But eventually when he learned to communicate using his eyelids by blinking, he then wrote a book. People then asked him, well, how do you feel about your life? <clears throat> you know, they thought he was in a vegetative state for a while because he was just non-responsive. He said he feels happier than ever. Feels great. Life is good. <laughs> He's worked through all the frailties of life and everything, and now he was he regarded himself as kind of set free to really live his life, even though he was actually utterly helpless. And so life really is what we make of it. But we have to deal with this frailty. And I think we have to deal with our maker. And today there's this idea of the names come up and this blessing. What does it mean to be blessed? The Lord loves to bless. You know, whenever I'm doing communion with strangers, I always say, come, look, if you don't normally take communion, come and be blessed, because the Lord likes to bless people. He's into it. If you like, he made us, if you like, to be vessels of his blessing. We are created in order for him to bless us. It's kind of what he wants to do. It's part of his relationship with us as he wants us to be blessed by him and for us to feel the benefit of that blessing and to be glad in it, to rejoice in it, to feel happy about it. In that respect, it's like giving presents. You know, sometimes if I've found a present for someone and it kind of works, it's something which really does mean something to them and they're actually delighted with it. It's actually really nice, isn't it, to do that. It's lovely to be able to give someone a gift that actually means something to them. You know, something which actually confers a real benefit, you know, something which they really rejoice in, or something which really benefits them. And that is something which the Lord has as well. He wants to give us things that really benefit us. But we need to be, if you like, put ourselves in the way to receive them, so that they actually do work, so they actually do benefit us. And so this desire from the Lord to bless us is a desire for us as well, to put ourselves in the way of that blessing, so that blessing really works, so it means something. But we're mixed up with this frailty and this sense of alienation in the world and that we don't always feel blessed. You know, we feel needy for it at times. We feel alienated from the world or from people or we feel hard done by it. We feel things are difficult and tough. We struggle with life. And therefore we want something, we're looking for something. And I believe the Lord has deliberately brought that about, so we will seek Him. So we will want His blessing. So we will turn to Him. And so that we will let go of the things that are not helpful, that are holding us back. So that we will enter His presence. Because this thing about the name, is that although we're born, we're made in this divine image, we're also made as strangers from God. We're alienated from Him. We need to be reconciled back to Him. And so that name somehow has been lifted from us. And the name needs to be put back with us. And here in these readings, it's explained to us how that will happen. The Lord will send His Son born, as it says in, in Galatians, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who are under the law. We who are slaves of sin and death, who as soon as we actually try and make ourselves better, feel the burden of our awkwardness. And if you've ever tried to do the right thing and then struggled that, you realise how hard it is sometimes. You try to make yourself a better person, you realise how difficult it is. Then you see someone else that seems to do it effortlessly and you realise how annoying that is. But also, you struggle and eventually you actually make yourself a bit better in some way and you kind of cling on to it, this kind of frigid grip of 
right, I've done it, I've made it. And then someone else messes up and you just feel angry with them or you feel, oh, why didn't you pull yourself together? I mean, it's this horrible dilemma of kind of helplessness that we can't make ourselves better or if we do make ourselves better, then we feel proud, we feel arrogant, we feel self-righteous, we cling onto it or whatever. It's awful, it's a real mess. And as Paul says, who will free us from this body of death? How will we escape? And this is how. To redeem us, that we might receive adoption as children. So that we're not forced to struggle to put ourselves together in the same way. We're not forced to make ourselves better. We'll simply be adopted as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba. Father, Abba is what babies and kids say to their daddies. So some people think it's undignified, but really the translation for Abba is daddy. It's what children say. It's the spirit of daddy. <laughs> the spirit of affection and warmth, of intimacy and respect and reverence. But intimacy and affection, and kindness, and trust above everything. And so we are no longer slaves but children, and if a child, then also an heir through God. And so this story is told about Jesus. After eight days had passed, it was time to circumcise the child, this baby. And he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And so he records it simply as a matter of fact. The child was born. On the eighth day he was circumcised according to the law. Therefore he was not just a descendant of Abraham, an inheritor of Abraham. He was under the covenant of Moses. He had entered the covenant of the people of, the, of Moses. He was circumcised. Therefore he had that mark in his body of that membership of the Israelites. He was born of an Israelite woman. Therefore, he was fully qualified. He didn't need any more process, if you like. And he had this name conferred on him, this name, Jesus, Yahushua, in the kind of long form of it. The Lord saves. Or the Lord is salvation, possibly. But it was who he is. He is the Lord, and he is the Saviour. And that name, is the name, the name of a son, the name of a saviour, the name of the Lord. In the psalm he said, Who, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him, or that you regard him? The psalm speaks of our frailty, our weakness. In material terms, you look on the vastness of the universe and think, well, what are we? We're just so small and insignificant, we kind of flicker in and out of existence like mayflies. And yet the Lord has conferred on us his image, his presence, and his name. When it talks about our position in creation, you've made him let earth and the angels, but crowned him with glory and honour. It's partly describing simply our place in the earth, that simply we're the most powerful thing on earth, in spite of our physical weakness. And when you think about animals, practically every animal does something that we can't do. A sparrow flies, I can't fly. A dog runs far more quickly than I can ever run. A cat climbs far better than I could ever climb. It sees in the dark better than I can. I mean, animals always do things better than us. Except we're the ones that rule them all. And yet the Lord has put his name on these frail, weak little people and lifted them up. And then that psalm, it says, you've crowned him with glory and honour. And that was taken to mean Jesus, who is then lifted up to sit at the Father's side, and crowned as King of kings and Lord of all, and put all things under his feet. So this isn't just about our position in creation. This is about Jesus as the King, the King of the world, the King of the angels, the King of creation, the King of everything, the Son of Man, the Son of God. The son of Mary, the son of Abraham, the son of David, Jesus. And this is the name which he'll put upon us, by which we will be adopted as children. And then by that name, 
and by that conferring of that name upon us, we can then be blessed. He will then bless us and keep us. He will make his face to shine upon us. He will be gracious to us. He will lift up his countenance upon us. And he will set to us peace. Christ is our peace. He is the one who restores us back to the Father, who reconciles us back to heaven and to earth, who restores our place in creation, who makes everything as it should be. He makes everything complete and satisfied. That's what peace means in this way. It is done, it is finished, it is satisfied, it is complete, it is well. Christ is our peace. And so it says, so shall they put my name upon the Israelites, and I will bless them. And so, let us put ourselves in the way of this name. Let us allow that name to be put upon us, so that we can be blessed, so that we can be restored and reconciled, so we can find our place in the world, our place in the order of things. And so we can flourish, so we can blossom, so we can be fruitful, and so we can just bask in the glow. May the Lord do all these things for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.